John for a wonderful introduction. I, I, you know, the only thing I think I would dread more if I did dread this than reading would be trying to introduce my book, which I have no idea I have to do. So thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it. And while I'm thanking, let me thank William uh, for, you know, helping to bring this book to life. It just changed everything for me in my life, and I couldn't be more grateful. I'm just very moved to be here. I had no idea when, you know, I was sending these pages off in the mail, going down to the post office, what even might come of it. I, I had no idea, so I'm, I'm just overwhelmed and very, very happy. Uh, and I also want to thank just the kind and expert and in my case, long-suffering staff of the Notre Dame, University of Notre Dame Press, for just producing the, the book I dreamed about. Uh, it's just, it's just so wonderful, and I, I'm really, really happy to hold it. Um, I thought publishing was about compromise, but this is just what I want. So that was, that was very, very fine. And um, I, I want also to uh, give a special uh, thank you to the dedicatee of uh, this volume, Time Speech, uh, here uh, known as Doug, uh, right over here. Uh, my friend since I was, uh, I don't know how, five years old, and he was uh, too young to remember. He's like a brother. But he really is like a brother to me, and without his memories and his thoughtful uh, talking over of places and times with me, we, we wouldn't have this book, or at least we wouldn't have it the way we have it now. So I'm very, very grateful and thankful. Thank you. I want to start with uh, a hybrid uh, form that I came up with that I call blues. Haiku. I want to blur from a Tupelo stump, like a crawfish in an endangered swamp. A purple blur from a Tupelo stump, then that crawfish pinching moss off a cypress knee, so standoffish. Ground fog swirling, smelling fresh as death, when the wind disturbs it, ground fog swelling, ammonia smell, fresh as death. Somebody mopping the kitchen, or baking meth. <laughs> what moving violation, unpaid citation, peccadillo, drove you, bandito? From what amarillo? What crime against nature, peccadillo? So far to the north, oh, nine-banded tire tread, armadillo. Affiliated drummers walk. It was unignorable that that was my song. The drummers low walk, walk, walk. It was unignorable. And not the sweet, sweet, sweet profanitaries warble. I might just walk barefoot down to that moody Mississippi, like a solder to the Ganges. Might work my feet into the mud, that mighty Mississippi, in the name of no power in the mud, but the muddy Mississippis. The towpath to the deep south, it don't feel too well, and it makes me woozy. Towpath to the river mouth, no, it don't feel too well. Laid up with a laughing gull in a brown pelican shell. Upon a mounded sand boil stared the witness tree since before the quake. On a sand boil glared the red oak hanging tree till a mercy bolt brought it down out of its misery. 
Iowa geezers hobbling down Cahokia mounds interpretive walk, pass a crumpled grasshopper cooking by Cahokia mounds. Then another, no, crawfish, a great egret must have found. Down an imitative river road in the warbler inflected breeze. Anything else? The old channel's tree line in the warbler inflected breeze. Lemon, 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 catfish and hush puppies. One that John mentioned, uh, Wahai, uh, is a drainage ditch which runs straight through southeast Missouri, where I'm from, the, what's known as the Boot Heel. It's uh, where I was uh, baptized into my girlfriend's church. It has an epigraph from Heraclitus, which I translated. We do step twice into the identical river. And we don't. <laughs> yes, we are from here. And then again, we're not. Whereabouts? These are from this sequence. Nothing happens around here without us knowing about it, though we never do know what hit us. The setting's so uneventful, we just hang around it, doing nothing. We're where it takes place. It's been going around, and we catch it, the swampiest misery, an undeserving condition, a feeling poorly, a sweetness preserved, plum cheeks flat against the jar. Was it somewheres we pulled down over our heads, up over our privates, caressed our thighs with, then couldn't hardly peel off to lay back on muggy sheets our worn souls, very deeply stained within? It must have took a hold of our tongues, wrung them into an accent nobody fails to place in a soggy paperback of commonplaces whose fused pages we can't read anymore but believe we know, a historical present we've come to expect, like the weather. It works in construction of that dream, me, unbelievably late, darting about like a dragonfly to deliver a lecture I misplaced on a topic I know nothing about. <laughs> Down branching basement corridors, bald lead pipe knees steaming, giving way to buckling tarred roof fields, chimney flues sticking up stump-like, when always I smack myself below my ear, gape at my bloody palm. Was that a mosquito? This one's called Gurnal, which is something you do to a tree to kill it. The dark cypress swamp giving way to the Swampland Act of 1850, sinking to rise no more. Slatches and sand ridges quaking still is superseded by the Little River Drainage District, a system of channels, tacks and concrete setback levees, water detention basins, block holes, for catching malarial night airs. The few stubborn beaver dams, which staunched the runoff, once they're dynamited clear, a rich black loam is reclaimed, unfurrowed, sown in swamp chestnut oak and sweet gum stumps, cut over bald cypresses, drowned bone white or coming back up brown mead, lost without their deep understory, the resurrection fern, stumps thick as dragon's teeth, pumpkin ash, burr oak, shell bark hickory, possum hoss, slippery elm, a 130-foot persimmon stump, having stumped 
the drag line crawlers, walking drag lines, steam powered stump pullers, where migratory snake birds fly over and cotton mouths yawn, stumps that one dark morning get on up and take their places back of the hickory plow to plow or a hoe to chop. My girlfriend lived in a place called Delmo, that's for Missouri Delta, and this poem on Jordan's stormy banks is the story of the place. It opens with an epigraph by John Hancox, who was known as the sharecropper poet. It's actually a song. Landless, landless are we, just as landless as landless can be. On Jordan's stormy banks, cook smoke after cook smoke, cornbread and fatback, all along the roadside, coffee, were Federal Route 60 out from Cairo, just past the turn of 1939, crosses 61 Highway up from Memphis. 100 miles of gray smoke pillars mushrooming overnight. Scarcely a car, wagon, or truck in sight. Had they picked themselves in a bulging cloud sack to be weighed at the plowed under margin? Croppers who'd flooded the Missouri boot heel, the bow weevil, the night rider behind them, tenanted with furnish, the landlord to provide them fertilizer, seed, and work stock, tar paper cabin, markup, and interest. Come the New Deal, paid not to plant, the Rarenback tells his croppers, get their parity shares in his hip pocket. But they'd convert that eviction into an exodus. Households heaped mile upon mile on the frozen road bank, interiors laid bare. For one wall, a dresser, partially handled, bareheaded or capped with a mirror. A corn shuck mattress doubled over, a box spring, a coop or a bed grill for another. Bed sheets and gray striped tablecloths knotted into swollen bundles. Thunder. Frozen rain reborn as weightless snow. Roofed with an oilcloth, blanket, or quilt, or an upended table. Out front, the cook stove, an oil drum converted, on which a black girl, hair scarred in what looks to be a pajama top follows or traces a design with her finger. One stout white toddler, bare-legged in January, picks me out from the lingering onlookers at Arthur Rothstein's photographs. So does the black girl's older brother. What can we do for you? Three black croppers in overalls and fedoras engage me directly through their picture. But a young white couple braced for their day, can't afford me much attention. The cropper who'd show them the way to sit right tight was long in coming. 1936, oven dry dark, Mr. Drinkwater's plantation. Brother Whitfield, parched, plows on. From cane to cane, daysight to night blind, coaxing his half-toned mule. Come on, boy, to that unpicked cotton bush, moon bone white. From out of the dark, his boy's far voice. No bread, no ham hock, no milk, no molasses, neither. <coughs> Whitfield pounds his knees into the furrow, offers up fist full of dust. Moonlight ignites the cotton bush. All my life I go by your book, the Lord to reward his servants. The good bush blazes back. I give you crops to fill your bones, but you let somebody lock them away, leave you the bone without the wish. Brother Whitfield dusts off his soul, comes to his feet, 
Southern Tenant Farmers Union men. And Moses gets them to the Red Sea, and they make camp there. Here come old boss pharaohs riding bosses in their chariots. It's history repeating itself in 1939. Not to be lynched, Brother Whitfield waits out of harm's way while croppers sing. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye. Jesus is my captain. I shall not be moved. Plagued with exploding flashbulbs, the landlords await the Red Cross. Who tells them they'll send no aid that might muddy the waters of the Missouri state? Suffering from this self-imposed health menace, this unprecedented traffic hazard. Hardened, the Rarenbacks dump these unsightly subjects out of focus into the spillway. Mississippi bottomland between two levees those same croppers had raised. Homeless junction, land of iced ditch water to drink, nothing to eat, no one to see. Too late, the post is dispatched, the herald sounds, the march of time too real tramps into movie houses. Eleanor writes them into her column. Franklin sees it wasn't good. Let's there be ten Delmo labor villages, <coughs> homes turned into segregated circles, water running hot and cold, electrical power, storage and garden, whatever it was they missed. Poverty grinding between gears like a newfangled traffic, as promised. We couldn't have a poem on baptism without the actual baptism, which is this poem, Castor Glands. Um, Brother Pascal, feet planted in Walhite, where bright angel feet have trod, with the authority given to him from Delmo Baptist Church by Jesus Christ, tilting John back with one hand under his backbone into the water, pinching the other over his mouth and nose, John musing on Sherry Kay's pudendo. How else to explain what I see next? Watches as a veering brown current Sleek and nippy as any from Castor River, firms and fattens into a yearling beaver that dips and swirls up before John's face and shows its incisors, enraptured it seems to have found him or caught him, as Castor at last is bollocks, I mean pollocks, <laughs> before it dives over, that is, under John's startled head making as if to bite off his shrunken scrotum for its sharp and leathery perfume castorium. John groping for the belt loops of his dress pants, had he worn them? When up bobs the singing embankment, Brother Pascal grinning at him, you're saved. <laughs> anything here anymore. I could raise up writhing out of this drowned river. I might as well try catching two fish off the same worm. Big Lionel swears you can. He's living with cancer now in an assisted living facility where he's begun now and then to recollect the same thing twice. He used to get the horse weeds round the side of the road, and he'd stop and find the weeds with the knots in them, slice off seven-inch sticks, and throw them in the bottom of the boat, and that'd be his bait. He'd split a stick end to end, and the little horse weed would be laying there, feeding on the marrow of the wood. He'd take the worm out, put it on a small hook, he'd have a split-shot sinker with a small floater, and he'd put it out on a long about a 14-foot pole and a 14-foot line on it, and he'd just 
dabble it around bald cypress logs and down in the hollow cypress stumps and live with fish and likely spots that a fish might be in the creek and when they hit it he just shook a little and he get his fish caught, which he caught a lot of bluegill. Mostly bluegill, but also goggle eye. Red ear, which is also called a shell cracker, it feeds on snails on the bottom of the creek and a crappie now and then, and he'd catch a bass occasionally, and occasionally he'd catch a catfish, though he'd been fishing for bluegill, like he says, with about a 14-foot pole, and he had about 14-foot of line on it, where he could toss it out round to likely spots where a fish might be, and when they hit it, his little floater go under, and he jerk and catch his fish. Now, a cricket is soft, and by the time a fish catches that, he actually grabs it in his mouth, and he tears it up. But a horseweed is tough, and he stays on. And you can catch half a dozen fish sometime, and the fish should still be hidden at this brown and yellow skin, hanging on the hook, which he caught a lot of bluegill. And in the name of Castor River, Little River Drainage District, Wall height Drainage Ditch, and in the name Block Letter, on the Long Gone Railroad Station's Long Gone Sign, W.A. Height, I put out this poem on about a four to five foot line, and in the name of John, I dabble it about bald cypress stumps and likely spots, and I keep my keyboard running and my eyes on the floor. <laughs> Panorama was a very long painting uh, that was set up on vertical rollers and uh, as it was rolled and unrolled uh, became a very popular uh, forerunner to the motion picture. It was the first motion picture in America and England and especially the traveling panoramas uh, were extremely popular, uh, none more so than uh, John Vanvoort's, uh, which I'm going to uh, tell you about in this poem. This poem formally is, was fun for me because it's all title. There's actually no, no poem. It's just, <laughs> it's just the title. And there's a little bit of self-parody, perhaps, uh, in this poem. Uh, we've lost uh, all, these, uh, all these panoramas from Vanvoort. Vanvoort's Three Mile. Moving Mississippi panorama, well, thanks to a pair of bevel-geared cranks and a row of suspended pulleys, unreeling the mighty canvas from one upright, upright roller onto another, transport you, seated, hands on knees, before the darkened proscenium, to its waking dream of pecan trees, festooned with the muscadine vine where along the way you will be ambushed off Plum Point by Merle's River Pirates, astonished by slaves cross-sectioning an aboriginal burial mound, amazed by such effects done up brown in the dioramic line as the New Madrid quake liquidating its banks, a gaslight moon paddling the rumpled canvas with arching brushstrokes, in the Crescent City's carnival thin bows, succumbing to ashes. This most mammoth pictorial voyage, praised alike by the poet of Evangeline and the author of Household Words, carrying Windsor Castle's distinguished mark of royal approbation, will cover in under two hours 1,200 miles of river with 700 gallons of paint. Casting certain foreign writers who scoff that America has no art commensurate with its size, face down into consternation. <laughs> this evening's river, narrated by none other than that 
sketcher of the lonesome skiff, John Banvard. Um, his poetry and pattern diversified by Madame Chuiso on her piano fort will commence once the night swells, unfasten his flat boat from mastodon bone bar upon which it has unaccountably snagged as your captain and artist, John Banford, serenely and hourly expects they will. <laughs> Shuffle first uh, saw life uh, outside my uh, notebooks and uh, keyboard in Notre Dame Review. And that, uh, that started me off towards uh, Time Speech, the book, so I'm so happy. Shuffle was about the, uh, the New Madrid earthquake, which uh, some of you may have heard of as one of the largest in uh, American history. Um, and New Madrid, uh, Missouri is my home county. The first poem is uh, called The Great Comet of 1811, which uh, came slightly before the, uh, the earthquake. The sequence settles uneasily upon a coincidence. The 1811 earthquake along the New Madrid Fault, one of the series of winter shakes that flattened and drowned woods in warm water up to a horse's belly, and thrust swamps up to steam their last steam, coincided with the first steamboat voyage on western waters, an ideal painted on the Pittsburgh steamer's hall, New Orleans. Unmuddied, a coincidence converges from nowhere, making no sense. Yet, when we cast our lots somewhere, we live in the midst of such occurrences, odd only at first, and we dwell on them, turning them over in our hands and making something of them, though some of us remain in the dark. No fizzling star, the great comet of 1811, with its moon-sized coma and its panther-length tail, wheeling across the fall and winter in next year's spring night skies, was read as a portent of wars and disasters, and was parodied as a portent almost as often as it was witnessed. It appeared to William Blake to betoken the immortal luck of even the tiniest spirit depicted in the ghost of a flea. To Pierre, love drunk in his black bearskin cloak at the entrance of Arbat Square, and, as it happened, Book Nine of War and Peace, it shone like a flaming arrow of Eros, lodged in the heavens and in his heart. Though Napoleon, fording the Neman, took it as a blessed ill omen of Moscow in flames. To the Tuckabachi Creeks, it appeared to magnify the name of the visiting Shawnee rebel, Tecumseh, leaping star. But to George, a Kentucky slave on an errand, it must have been up to no good. While to the designer and the writer, Nicholas Roosevelt, it probably meant no more than nature's parting shot across the bow, twilighting his steam-powered deck. This is about uh, Roosevelt uh, the boy. It's in the genre, I guess I should mention, it's in the genre of the Aesopian fable. And if you go back to those, one thing I like is that it's not only animals talking, but, but often inanimate objects take, take character parts. So this is called The Boy in the Mill. Why do you churn the water so, unevening the creek? Little Nicholas called out. Throwing up nine of her 18 hands, Flora, <laughs> the red flower mill across the stream, glared back 
determined to deal handily with this impertinent child lounging on the opposite dock. The word you want is roiling. In any case, it's the stream turning me, not me, the stream. It's getting dark. My mistake, shouted the boy, hurrying away through the reddening sugar maples. Before long, across the creek, named by a happy coincidence, Esopus, the Muncie, Sopus, meaning brook, merging in the Dutch ear, as luck would have it, with the Greek fabulous, he reappeared. Under his arm was an odd contraption, looking to Flora like a crude replica of herself, pierced with a mud-stained axle tree, at either end of which was a red wheel that happened to bristle with 18 cedar shingle paddles, its axle sprung with whalebone and hickory wood. One wheel pressed against his stomach, the boy started winding the other. When he set the tiny mill boat loose in the water, it floated briskly over to its appalled prototype, bumping one of Flora's paddles with a plock. But old Esopus soon unruffled her. Well, all you like, the die is cast. My uh, parents happened to meet on a St. Louis streetcar, which helps account for me and mine. The odds against us. Then again, maybe so. What if he'd landed the job? The stars would wink back. She'd have been working late, would, if in luck, had boarded the block before. Her fingers stained with streaming hand-colored sunsets, ten cents a card, fireflies, the blue moon, almost a cost. The night's last streetcar must have crackled to a halt. Olive Street, 1941. On deck, no seat. Then he lit on hers. But would he feel odd? He needed a smoke because he wanted her number. But would he be given the nod? No odds or even. And what about us? Were we coaxed from afar? We'll never know better. Or were we a coincidence waiting to concur? What if the twilight had failed her? Her haunting cards might well have been blurred and blackened. They'd ride lost in second thoughts. His son of a bitch of job had got away. She'd cut a deal about her age and worked for nothing. A hundred mud pied sunsets. But wait, she wouldn't have known that yet. So what? If he hadn't happened to have had a pencil, she wouldn't have minded. The hand against any two things coinciding is high. But luck is fibrous, nebular, overriding, and ruddiest when the stellar core fails. She'd reach inside her purse, pull out her lipstick, hand paint her number all the way up his sleeve. The whole car had to have laughed. His starched and flattened arrow shirt. Her piecework read. And it did happen. It happened that way. You call, you would call that number. <laughs> um, George uh, is the young man who was owned by the nephews of uh, Thomas Jefferson. He's fetching water in this poem uh, with an ancestral Wedgwood picture. This is called Rocky Hill Spring. Mud is the spit of the Lord. These words, or their like, wheel about the head bone of George, the decaying Lewis family's ill-thrived errand boy. 
On that headbone road, Mother Jefferson's picture, on which Aquarius had cast his silhouette in a darker blue. Pure coincidence, George had made it seem, when he'd wonder back a good deal later or earlier than look for, with cinchona bark or the ague shakes, or a storied pitcher full of water sprung from Rocky Hill for dinner. Errands that happened never to fulfill Wilburn's or his near-term Letitia's glaring dictates even halfway. This December night, George ambled his odd amble up the steep north slope, meticulous to a fault, the perching frost packed at each of his tips and orifices, as in a Kentucky bottom's noonday steam, a carmine and lemon streaked emerald blanket of Carolina parakeet that crack and discard each burr of a cocklebird field, its fruit dug out and consumed. Nero, the famished black househound, looked on ahead of him. George, too, independent headed, going on 18, lashed of late for his skulking spell. The border patrollers diverted by Chickasaws down to the mud flats, cane break mosaic, sun baked tiles so insolently curled. He'd fish the night on an Ohio sandbar, bar so shallow a body might fish itself across from a bound shore to an unbound. Crouched tonight by the spring on an egg shaped rock. George took a long, cool think. He spat, and Nero lapped it up. Then he leaned down and scooped out a handsome shard of Wedgwood. We're out of time, so <laughs> let me thank you all very much, and uh, thank you.